I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian, and welcome to The Sidebar, a weekly show on the community, arts, culture, and more. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Jennifer Bowen, Executive Director of Kindred Place. So stay with us for a conversation with Jennifer. Jennifer, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. For, for people who aren't familiar, what is Kindred Place? Kindred Place is a resource for families in Memphis and Shelby County. We have counselors, coaches, and educators who help people work on their family relationships. And we think that's something great for every family to do. The, um, we're in the holiday season. as We're recording this actually before Thanksgiving, but it's airing after Thanksgiving. Um, holidays are, are they're wonderful. They're great. They're so wonderful and so great. And they're really stressful. Right. I mean, it's it, not everybody thinks they're so wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of family pressure. There's a lot of financial pressure. There's a yeah. lot of pressure to make things perfect. There's a sense of maybe for some people feeling left out. I mean, there's all kinds of things that go on. Full gamut. So people who are super excited about the holidays and have expectations for this, you know, wonderful time of year. Awesome. People who are dreading the holidays and would just sort of like to fast forward into January or February. Awesome. Also, you know, we the, one of the things we say at Kindred Place is you're entitled to feel the way you feel and entitled to express what you need. So if the holidays, for anyone listening, if the holidays feel like a burden, you are not the only one who's feeling that way. Um, Super stressful, particularly for families who have unresolved conflict. So things that they have difficulty talking about or things that they are grieving or working through that, you know, they try and gloss over because everybody's supposed to be happy and cheerful during the holidays. So they sort of park that in the background. Yeah. Sometimes that gets in the way of actual enjoyment. The, it, it, when I was getting ready and reading about Kindred Place and thinking about these kinds of issues. It, it is like, I've, I've seen this to somebody. I have no idea who I was saying it to, but I was, you know, anyone can be a parent theoretically, you know, um, it doesn't require a license. Biologically. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. Biologically you can be a parent, right? You can pretty much get married. Like, and there are not roadmaps or requirements of any depth to do these really profound things that, you know, People do often in their twenties <laughs> or, or, or uh, teens, or you sometimes know? in their fifties. Yeah. You know, is yeah. yeah, yeah. No roadmap, no rules, no instructions that come. Um, that is the most challenging, maybe work that anybody can do, and frustrating and wonderful and rewarding all at the same time. When you get people in, you know, into kindred place, I mean. Is that in and of itself though a revelation? Like it's like people do go into relationships, whether with a child or with a partner, with an expectation. You know, well, this is the way my parents did it, and I want to do it that way because that's how it's done. Or I don't want to. I absolutely do not want to do what my parents did. But that they don't necessarily articulate those things. They just have these kind of. We said there's no roadmap, but they might have sort of this notion, you know, of the perfect white picket fence where everyone's always happy or the. Whatever it is, is it partly just getting people to talk about those expectations and those notions and to define them to themselves, let alone to their partner or their child or whoever? That's well, surely that's one thing. You know, there's there's no roadmap for this kind of work either. One of the things I've learned in six and a half years at Kindred Place is that there are no two families who are alike or no relationships that are exactly alike, but there are some themes. And so the ones you described, some people come in for a parenting class or a workshop or for individual therapy because they don't want to repeat what happened in their childhood. They want to yeah. make sure that they've got the skills and that they've worked through their own stuff and that they know what to do with their kids. Some people are just anxious in general because they're doing something they've never done before and they they don't want to make a mistake and they don't want to do something that you know that gets in the way of having a child thrive and they don't know how to do it because they're it's not a skill you really get to practice so it is it's it's those things and more um some of the families who come to us or some of the people who come to us even before their parents want to work through complex or complicated trauma from the past. Like they've had an experience that was really in the way of being able to have healthy relationships going forward and they want to heal from that before mm -hmm. they um, before they move on. So it, it's every different thing. And sometimes it's as simple as we've had families who their kids are home from college for the first year for the holidays and they just kind of want to check in and and have a, a, a therapy check-in to just talk about 
life and how it's going. Yeah. Um, again, talking today with uh, Jennifer Ballant, the executive director of Kindred Place. Kindred Place, a, a nonprofit. It is. A 501c3. What's the background? I want to come back to more of what you just said, but just a little bit more about the context of Kindred Place, its history and where it was and where it is. Sure. I'll try and make it short. It's a, it's a 40-year-old. We turned 40 this year oh, yeah. and have had a campaign to celebrate that. 40 years ago, we were founded by local exchange clubs, which are civic organizations, kind of like Rotary Kiwanis Exchange Clubs are in communities across the U.S. And they raised money to start a family center to help parents learn non-physical ways of nurturing, supporting, disciplining their children. So in the late 70s, early 80s is when people started paying attention to parenting and to children. So court-appointed special advocates or CASA was founded in that same time frame. The idea for child advocacy centers sprang up in that same time frame. So we were one of 150 or so centers around the country created to help coach parents in parenting. And over 40 years, we evolved in all the ways that a young organization does. We started new programs, stopped those programs, expanded those programs, shrank those programs, and the pandemic hit and everything was sort of different. But many people know us under our old name, the Exchange Club Family Center. We changed names about five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh- it's inter- Exchange Club, by the way, completely digression. I'm speaking at the Fraser Exchange Club yeah. in February. This is like one of the high points because like I'm, people are nice enough to ask me to speak. But the Fraser Exchange Club and Natalie Van Gundy, producer of Behind the Headlines and Sidebar, we talk. They get the most amazing lineup of people, and I'm, I'm like so honored that they actually asked me to come finally after all these years. It's where I it's mean, at. Let's just I do. Mean, let's Fraser just do Exchange a thirty. 30- is a force. It's yeah. a force, and Shelley Rice is such a. Um, a magician in bringing all that together. Yeah. Frasier, you know, for anybody who hasn't been to a Frasier Exchange Club meeting on Thursday, I would encourage yeah. you to check it out. Yeah. yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but um, back to the more serious stuff you're talking about here. Uh, we're, again, we're talking to Jennifer uh, Balink from uh, uh, Kindred Place. I mean, it is interesting to think about there's crisis intervention, right? Court appointed. When you start talking about that, you're talking about uh, probably a crisis has happened, mm-hmm. nearly happened. We're trying to build the pieces. But a lot of what it seems like a lot of what you do now is to try to completely head those things off. Absolutely. Yeah. So it, you know, one of the quotes that's written on our walls, uh, Desmond Tutu's quote, at some point, it, we have to stop pulling people out of the river and go upstream and keep them from falling in. Yeah. And that and that is the idea of trying to help people build healthy relationships, starting with their a relationship with their self, themselves. That's a hard, tough sentence to say. Um, yeah. Can't be in a healthy relationship if you're not healthy in yourself. So partnered relationships, parenting relationships, adult children's relationships with their parents. There's a whole body of work that we've talked about exploring and building a kindred place for parents of adult children. I mean, this is something that, you you know, close to home, I think here at this table, when your kids are all of a sudden grown of grown age, how to be their parents is a new challenge. Yeah. I think I was built for this phase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people. I've loved parenting. I have two kids. And yeah. I, they're now 23 and 24. My daughter just turned 23. This to me is just endless fun. We were talking about before the show that we were just up in New York where my daughter was going to college and visiting her and it was her birthday and my son came out from California and then they're coming up for the holidays. And um, it's awesome and it is amazing. But I know it is not that way for everyone. I mean, I'm lucky and right. I worked at it and my kids are lucky and wonderful and have worked at it, you know, because and it's a huge evolution. Working at it is a real, you know, it is work. Parenting is work. One of the the things that I, I am encouraged during the pandemic, there are a couple of things we started talking about that I think are really helpful. One is that talk therapy is helpful in so many ways to talk about something that's just living inside your head can really help anybody move forward. So big, big fan of that. The other thing is the reality of what it is to be a parent, you know, and when, as we saw on zoom screens, people who were trying to be teachers and caregivers and also be in meetings all at the same time at home, it made visible something that was already true. So that work of parenting is work and you you can get better at it if you get you know help and support i remember one thing with little kids was and i loved my little kids too i mean it was just fun and it was i i I enjoyed the fun stuff of that and all that but it is just nonstop and exhausting Mm -hmm. and it and that's even without a pandemic and zoom and one of those things i had to learn was 
like it's okay to be kind of annoyed sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's okay to be exhausted by it. It's not all like because I came from a family where it was not so great. And so I just wanted it all be great and mm-hmm. perfect, mm-hmm. you know, in its way. And that meant I was never supposed to be tired of it. You know what I mean? Or yeah. bored of it or slightly annoyed or whatever. And that I just remember that when they were little, like some days it's just a little long. <laughs> and, and it's hard. You know, I, I remember talking uh, to a friend who we, when our kids were like three and five, you know, the pace of what how they want to do things yeah. is so slow that it, I just wasn't wired for that. And I think that's those are great examples of where it can be helpful to talk to somebody who can tell you what's normal in child development right. and what your child needs from you. So sim- a simple thing, young children need to know that they can trust the world and they learn that from their parents so when children are acting out when they are crying when they are you know throwing tantrums they are expressing a need that they don't have the words for yet and so what parents can do is respond in a way that helps them build the language to say what they need and sometimes that is super frustrating and hard and exhausting and, and it's where a parent coach or a therapist can help um, we'll come back to a bunch more of that, but I want to just remind everybody, this is the sidebar. Uh, it airs on WYXR 91.7 every Thursday at 1130. I'm Eric Barnes, uh, CEO of the Daily Memphis and host of the sidebar. Um, and again, we're here with Jennifer Ballant, the executive director of Kindred Place. Um, the show, the sidebar though, is focused uh, every week on the community, arts, culture, everything in between. Uh, it's not just a radio show though. It's one of many weekly podcasts we do at the Daily Memphian, including the Behind the Headlines podcast, which is really the audio version of the show we do over on WKNO. We we also do a number of sports podcasts. We do Jennifer Biggs and Chris Harrington's food podcast, Sound Bites, which also airs here on WYXR every Thursday at 11. All of our podcasts are on the Daily Memphian site, as well as iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, this podcast, if you missed any day, it'll be up on WYXR.org, or you can download the WYXR app, which is a great way to listen, not just to this show, but all the talk shows and all the uh, uh, all the audio shows are up um, archived on WYXR.org, which is a great way um, to um, um, listen. Um, YXR just had its second anniversary probably a month ago now, but uh, a couple months ago now, but it all blurs together. Um, they We are a nonprofit radio station and and support um, the, the the WYXR by becoming a member, by doing a donation. All that's on the WYXR site. So um, it is a great uh, endeavor and feels much older than two years in the best possible way. Um, recently, we did a show, I think just last week, on the 20th anniversary of Nut Remix. And we had Katie Smythe from New Ballet and Lil Buck came on. Um, so that was pretty cool. And uh, coming up, we've got Candace Eccles, a, a columnist, a relatively new columnist for Daily Memphis. We'll talk to her about what she's writing about and why. I mentioned behind the headlines over in WKNO, um, we've got Ted Townsend, the new head of the Memphis Chamber coming on. I think it's this week. Um, also, Steve Mulroy, the relatively new um, district attorney for Shelby County. He'll be coming on about 100 days into the, his new gig. Recently, we did a show on economic development on Bartlett. We did shows uh, with a show with the folks from MIFA and the Food Bank. And some months ago, we did a show that was partly about Tommy Pacello. Uh, Tommy Pacello was former head of the Memphis Medical District. He was involved with all kinds of everything from the Tennessee Brewery to um, the cool redevelopment of the the Broad Avenue area. He would never claim that he did it all himself. He didn't, but he was very much involved in all this kind of rebuilding of of Memphis. Passed away two years ago, very at a, what forty two years old. Seems very young. And you can learn more about Tommy. We did a show with some of his friends, Paul Young, uh, John Zena, uh, Sutton Moore, all came on to behind the headlines. And there's a, a, a recent show on WYXR that you can just Google it and all about Tommy, a lot of his friends and family um, and what some of the impact that uh, he had. And there's a launch of a fellowship um, supporting the kinds of, of work that Tommy did that you'll hear about on that. So search for the Tommy, I think it's the Tommy Pacello Fellowship. I should write it down more formally. formally. Last bit of housekeeping is uh, on December 1st, which may, might be today, might actually be today, Thursday, December 1st. That's it. Uh, our, the Daily Memphian is hosting its commercial real estate summit, uh, or it's not a summit, it's a commercial real estate seminar um, at the Botanic Garden at 3 p.m. Um, you can go to, um, uh, oh, what's it called? Eventbrite, and you can learn more details about it, who the guests are, who uh, will be speaking. Um, you may not be able to get t- tickets on Eventbrite, but if you just show up and you say you heard it on the sidebar and you mention my name, you can get in. 
You can get in for free. That's I, that's the deal I just made up right there. Um, so again, that's the commercial real estate, talking about uh, industrial, talking about uh, office, talking about residential, talking about all kinds of things going on with commercial real estate today, December 1st at 3 p.m. at the Botanic Garden. Um, but we are still here with uh, Jennifer Ballant from um, – the from executive director of Kindred Place, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary. Um, it, it is interesting. I think about. I mean, now that I'm, you know, the age I am, the evolution of 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 uh, of how people think about therapy and counseling, and it does seem like it's taken a really sudden shift for the better in the last few years. And then COVID, even pre-COVID. And then it seemed to accelerate. I think some of that's my kids' generation. They're very open about talking about therapy, wanting therapy, needing therapy, having been in therapy. All their friends are. It's not a they they've sort of just culturally, I'm not this is not everyone, but it just feels overwhelmingly like a lot of the stigma, which I grew up with. I mean, I remember my mom when I was probably in my I was probably 20, and we were talking on the phone, and she said she'd been at the doctor and complaining about all these things. And they said to her, well, maybe you need to go to a therapist. And she said, and I just got up and I just left. I couldn't believe that that doctor told me that it was all in my head. And I remember I didn't have the words to say, mom, it is all in your head. And that's the problem. Yeah. Cause you know, in hindsight, she was, you know, my mom was wonderful, but she struggled with depression, you know, in hindsight for much of her life. And she viewed that statement from that doctor. Like, I can't help you with medicine, I can't help you with a therapy, with a physical therapy, but I think there are things going on. And she, she was utterly offended, you know, and my dad was similar that way is similar that way about therapy and notions of therapy. And, but I think yeah. there's this kind of hopefully generational shift about openness to that therapy and counseling increasing. I Absolutely. A, ther- a, a shift for so many reasons, you know, think about, all of the things that come together to, that make it feel okay to feel okay about talking to somebody about the thoughts that are in our heads. And Brene Brown's a great example. So all of her books about shame and vulnerability and the the courses that she has led and, and her various TED Talks, my favorite of her books is the most recent, The Atlas of the Heart, naming all the different feelings and emotions you know she said uh, how pg are we on the uh, so to, uh, so when writing in her book if you're not familiar she said we have three feelings happy sad and uh, angry she said it in a different way <laughs> and and so exploring the whole range of what feelings are there i think it is it used to be common that people thought that was private and not something to talk about and now recognize that it's something that when you talk about it, it can actually get better. You can feel better inside your head. So blah, blah, blah about uh, therapy. What The other thing that you I thought of when you were talking about stigma and changes in our kids and what they're open to, I think the the isolation of the pandemic helped people see where being connected with other people really matters and what it means to feel alone versus lonely and what it is to live with just the thoughts in your head. And so talking to another person about that can can really be transformative, whether you live by yourself or live in relationship with other people. It certainly affects your relationships. And for parents who are struggling with whatever – they believe they have to just suck up and do on their own. You know, it's the job of parenting, so you just need to get sturdy and handle it. Talking to a therapist or a parent coach about what that's like can make a better experience for the parent and certainly for the children who need the parent there. So I'm a fan. It's interesting, too, that I was thinking about this. Uh, maybe it's just the podcast I listen to, but there's so much advertising for um, the uh, these online, mm-hmm. um, which really exploded the the mm-hmm. use and availability and so on of, of online um, uh, therapy exploded during the pandemic for obvious reasons without the, you can judge it if you want, you know, the effectiveness of it or where that goes. Um, it is interesting. You just kind of get all this advertising about therapy and it's advertising about therapy that isn't cryptic. Mm-hmm. So I, I can sort of think of, you know, you, you come to a, you know, there's certain types of therapy ads in the past, come to our place by the river and find peace. And like, what is this? Am I going on vacation? Is right. it like, am I, am I in rehab? Like, it's very cryptic. Like what, whereas a lot of this advertising now for the online health is 
using the language of therapy of depression, of you're going through a hard time, you can try to get help. Like it's much more explicit and it's, it's not, um, gauzy. No. And, and so the, the flip side of that truth with all this language around us, who's a, um, uh, a couple of therapists on who have great social feeds. Um, Nedra Tawab is one who I think is just brilliant in her writing on Instagram. And one of the things she's been writing about recently is how therapy terms have gotten so ingrained in our vernacular that we throw around words like narcissism and anxiety and depression and toxic and they're easy to use because they're everywhere. And so real clinical diagnosis words, you know, depression is a clinical diagnosis. And so to say, I feel depressed and to be diagnosed with clinical depression are, are two things that can be the same and they can be really different. And so the way to explore that is to talk to somebody who is trained, equipped, experienced in, yeah. in knowing the difference. And I think that's where the all the talk about therapy and clinical help and working with a specialist is terrific and removing the stigma is terrific and helpful I, facebook is not a therapist and you know there's not that so the resources that are available to explore mental well-being are are super if anybody listening is struggling really wondering if this is something you should just soldier on and bustle through or whether you need to talk to somebody there's no harm in exploring talking to a professional who can make some suggestions that maybe it's you know just a redirect and sometimes it's something deeper so that I think we've broken through the log jam that was in the way of doing that. Yeah. It, it is interesting about the, I mean, I throw around those terms too loosely sometimes. You I, know, like PTSD. I've got PTSD yeah, from right. that, you know, from eating too much sugar. Right. You know, right, something right, that right. is not really PTSD worthy, you know. Right. Or I'm people say, you know, you're, you're, you're so OCD, you know, why yeah. you have to organize your books? Well, it, you know, that is a, that's a, it is, it's funny, not funny. And so yeah. the, the good part yeah. is that I think we, can talk now to the other side of that. Yeah. Um, and what brought you to this uh, work? A happy accident. And so this, I have a career that spans a bunch of different things. I've worked in marketing and public relations for most of it. It's been one of the three lines and was working at the community blood center in marketing and donor engagement when this job was posted. And one of uh, my longtime friends and supporters and somebody who's active in the philanthropic community recommended that I ask about it. And, and the connection was turning around something that had been kind of misunderstood. And so they, so looking for somebody with some marketing communications background, but also with like a sort of a range of experience. So I stumbled into it and I stumbled into it at a time when my kids were in middle school, about to enter high school, and wasn't really expecting to have a personal connection to the work. I guess all work's personal, but it has been so rewarding to learn tips and techniques and skills and language around parenting that I didn't know about just working there. And, and so the passion for the work comes from wishing everyone had that kind of support that we could you know, I think it, we would love for everybody to come see us. Um, and you were involved with a number of things, but mm -hmm. one was you were founder, co-founder of Books from Birth. Yeah. I, um, this is a super short story. The The Governor's Books from Birth Foundation in Tennessee launched a program to match – funding for any Tennessee county that would start an imagination library. And so they were going around county by county. Shelby County has more children under age five than any other county in Tennessee. That's still, that statistic still true. And so it was kind of overwhelming figuring out how we were going to get this started. And Mayor Wharton in a meeting one day in March of 2005, dropped his finger on a date in his book without looking at it. And he looked at me and said, June 12th, go figure this out. So like, Okay. So the Community Foundation helped us get Books from Birth launched, and and it continues now at Porter Leith. It is one of the things I'm most proud of being involved in. Imagination Library is awesome. If you have children under five, you're listening, you have children under five, and you are not enrolled in Books from Birth, the Imagination Library, you can go to the Porter Leith website and sign up. 
Yeah, and uh, uh, Natalie Van Gundy, producer here, is a uh, was yes, is very much endorsing that for her. And so, I, so I'll put both hats on talking about this because parents being with children with a book, whether you read the book or don't read, the, you know, holding the book, turning the pages, that experience of being with a child exploring something is a critically important part of parenting for the parent and for the child. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I can think of, I mean, my f- best memories of my kids when they were little was yeah. reading to them, you know, yeah. and uh, was, I mean, it was great. Um, and then you were, uh, um, it what was is it? Li- li- Lifeblood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't, why? I just yeah. couldn't do that. Well, now, and now it's called Vitalant. So, you know, name changes make everything hard. Uh, it is? Y- yeah. It was. Wait, Lifeblood is Vitalant? Lifeblood is Vitalant. So we merged with, so it, it's, uh, when I left, we had been recently merged into an organization called, that was called Blood Systems that's now called Vitalant that's based in yeah. Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, yeah, we, we could spend a long time talking about a really simple thing, which is that people are are afraid of giving blood and blood saves people's lives. Yeah. And both yeah. things are true. Yeah. Um, and then the archaeology, I was curious about that because an archaeology and art background that then translate in all this. Uh, my father would have told you I had a degree in cocktail party conversation, <laughs> and he was worried that I was ever going to be able that? to have no, no, really, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the The department was art and archaeology. My my specialty was in visual art, and I taught art right after college. And it was a challenge to live in Boston and figure out how I was going to pay the bills. And so I got a marketing job, and that led me yeah. down a really different path. But I still am a practicing artist, and still. I oh. encourage everybody to explore the artist that lives in them. Yeah. That might be part of my TED Talk in February. Might, <laughs> might be. For, oh, that's right. That's right. So you'll be at, uh, at TEDx Memphis, yeah. uh, the New Memphis and others. I think we're a media sponsor of that. So yeah. um, that's great. Um, with just a minute or so left, I always try to ask people because YXR is a music station, um, what your first concert was. My first concert is so embarrassing and true. It was the Beach Boys at the Coliseum. That's not bad. That's not bad. You aren't even on the charts embarrassing of shows that people have been to. So yeah. no, I think I, I think I think we've had the Beach Boys. But I think I think we have because the Beach Boys are awesome. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, still, yeah, yeah. In their well, own it's way. all good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, I mean, it's just, and then, yeah, people have their kind of, well, there's the first show I really went to, and then the first show I bought a ticket for, but Beach Boys at yeah. the Coliseum. Okay. Beach Boys at the Coliseum. It's the first one I remember. Okay. Uh, again, Jennifer Ballant is the executive director of Kindred Place, celebrating its 40th anniversary. People can learn more. It's a nonprofit. 501c3, they can learn more at kindredplace.org. Everybody. There's a hyphen between kindred and place. So okay. it's kindred-place.org. Okay. okay. But that is all the time we have this uh, week. Uh, again, the music that uh, you're hearing or about to hear is Deering and Down. Now I know. A reminder, the sidebar airs every Thursday at 1130 on WYXR 91.7. Also a podcast available on the Daily Memphian site, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Please just subscribe to this podcast. Subscribe to the Daily Memphian. Become a member of WYXR. That's a lot of homework assignments, but you should do it. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next week.